My name is Rian Waller and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the biology department uh, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So there are basically two different types of coral. There are corals with a photosynthetic algae and these are the corals that you'll see snorkeling off the Great Barrier Reef or off of the Florida Keys. Um, and these need the sunlight and the warmth to be able to survive. And then you have the second type of coral that doesn't have this photosynthetic algae and that means that it can survive in really cold water and it can also survive really, really deep. So it doesn't need the sunlight at all to survive. These corals can, uh, can actually live down to about 5,000 meters, so that's around 16,000 feet or around three, three miles down. So there's no sunlight whatsoever to these corals. They survive solely on food fall from above. So little animals and plankton that have died in the water and raining down on top of these corals. That's how they survive instead of using sunlight like the shallow water corals. So you can find these deep water corals in a lot of different locations. One of the biggest reefs in the world is up in Norway at around 300 meters depth, and that's around 16 kilometers long. You can find these deep water corals off the continental shelf of Cape Cod, off the New England seamounts and the Cornerized seamounts, which is where I personally work. You can find it on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, on the East Pacific Rise, um, off of the coast of Hawaii, off of seamounts off of Hawaii. But also what you can get them in really extreme locations. You actually find deep water corals off of the coast of Antarctica. And these corals live in about 0.5 degrees Celsius water. And for half of the year, the surface water is ice covered. How do these corals survive there? We don't know as yet. And we're going down to try and investigate that. And so one of the big questions that I'm trying to answer is why are they found where they are? We don't really understand why some corals are found on some seamounts and yet you go to another seamount and there are no corals whatsoever. So questions like the environmental tolerances, how do they survive in salinity and temperature, um, are big questions that I'm trying to answer. So one of the major things that I look at is I'm a reproductive biologist. So I'm really looking at how these deep water corals reproduce and disperse across these major ocean basins. One of the coolest things about deep water corals is how they form these really large habitats, these little bioherms that attract a lot of other deep water fauna to them. Um, you get a lot of species of fish and invertebrate come and live around these, these deep water coral reefs and they can use them for protection, they can use them for feeding, so the fish will feed on crabs or starfish that are living around the corals, and they can also be used for harboring their young, so a lot of species will come and lay eggs on top of the corals. Um, to, and then these corals, when the eggs hatch, the young can then feed around the deep water corals and really get a good start on life. So this unfortunately means that there are a lot of commercial species of fish that live around these deep water corals as well. So like orange ruffy or grenadier or even some species of grouper live around deep water corals. So as the usual traditional fisheries of cod and haddock are running out, many fishermen are moving into much deeper waters to be able to maintain their livelihood and maintain the catches to help them survive. Um, so there are uh, new forms of fishing gear that are being developed, such as deep water trawling. These deep water trawls, if you can imagine a really large net, it's got a 100 meter wide mouth, two really large heavy doors at either side that keep this mouth open. And then on the very bottom of this mouth, you have these things called rock hoppers or rollers. These are really large, heavy, circular or round weights that help to keep the mouth of the net open and also help it to bounce off the bottom. These nets are designed specifically to be able to run right over the bottom of even hard surfaces. So these rock hoppers and rollers will just run straight over the bottom and will actually smash up and break up boulders and corals and sponge reefs that are in the way. So once a, a trawler goes through an area, there's literally nothing left except dead pieces of coral and sponge and, and rocks that are everywhere. A lot of these trawlers have been known to move big boulders that are several thousand pounds in weight. That's how, how heavy these rock hoppers are. So if you can imagine a single trawler working for one day can put down its nets around three or four times a day. Now the area of that is about 10 kilometers squared. That's about three football fields that a single trawler can troll up in a single day. So that's three football fields that are left bare on the seafloor. So one of the good things right now is there's a lot of researchers who are interested in looking at deep water corals because of all these threats to them that are happening imminently. So there's a lot of biologists and geologists and physical oceanographers who are looking all around the habitat that these deep water corals create. 
And so this means that there's going to be a lot more research, a lot more public attention paid to deepwater corals. At the moment, the newspapers and websites are really picking up on the damage. There's a lot of stories run on the trawling impacts and how these deepwater corals are found, even off of the UK and off of Cape Cod coast, in places that people never expected to see deepwater corals. So the more we know, the more we're going to be able to protect these habitats properly, so that we might even be able to manage them sustainably for fisheries, so that these fishermen can go out and catch deepwater species without damaging the habitat. This podcast is a production of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. For more information, visit us on the web at www.whoi.edu.